and I was had a little bit of nosebleed on Saturday before the feast began. Had a little bit of shortness of breath and headaches, and that they all tell me that's elevation sickness. And so it took a few days to get through that. I spoke on opening night, so that was not exactly the greatest time to begin, but I was okay, and God saw me through, and as he normally does, and I was happy to to be there for the feast. I was a little more huffy puffy uh, in my breathing than I would have normally been. But it's nice, it was a beautiful setting. They had the most beautiful weather there that they've had. It was all nice, all nice, the, all the time we were there. So I think it was this coming week it's supposed to snow a little bit, so I don't know how much. But uh, se several saw lots of wildlife. Some people saw like, uh, what is it, elk or in their backyard or in, in their outside their condo, bears and, and different things. So we saw gray deer with white tails coming back down. They were on the side of the road, of the, the, the uh, fawn and the doe, several fawns and a doe were right there on the side of the highway. So it was really nice. Others saw bighorn sheep and so on. So if you like... And, and we actually had something I'm probably going to bring if I can do it. Our opening, when we got there the first night, we wanted to have something to eat in our bellies before I spoke. So we went down and they had elk chili. So I've looked in Cincinnati. There is a place where I can get some elk meat. So I hopefully we will make elk chili. So you might want to look, on, look out for that. And... My wife and I will try to put it together for you, and that'll be a, a, a remembrance of up there. And the elk tastes really good, so we were happy to have that. There's no, no wild taste or anything in it, so it was really great to have that that opening night. They never did have it again. We ate it several times at the cabin, and they didn't have elk chili anymore, but they did have it the opening night. It's great to be back, nice to be home. It's also awesome to be at the feast. We saw about 16 or more people that we have known for a while, some for years, I put on Facebook, we put on Facebook a, a young lady that we knew in 1984, she graduated from Ambassador, and we haven't seen her in about 30 years. And she and her husband still hanging in there, they're down in, in an independent group in, in the uh, Kansas City area. But it was wonderful to see her. She sat right beside us. She and her husband sat right beside us the opening night. And then we managed to visit with them after that. But it was a great feast for visiting and meeting people that we have known through the years, college students, former college students, ABC students, and others. It was really awesome to be able to be there. And to me, that was what the greatest uh, event that we had, highlight of our feast, was meeting so many of these wonderful people and seeing so many of God's people. The music was outstanding. It was, it was wonderful at uh, Steamboat Springs. So anyway, we are so glad to be back and glad to be here with you. Since we've just returned from the feast, we were there picturing God's wonderful kingdom to come. I hope you had a view of it. I hope you had some picture of what it represents by being at the Feast of Tabernacles. We had that foretaste. Moses was given a foretaste or a view, not actually a foretaste, but an actual view into the promised land. Let's take a look at the scripture in Deuteronomy 32, verse 48. If you want the title of this sermon, it's Moses didn't make it, will you? Moses didn't make it, will you? So Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 48 to 52. So God is speaking to Moses just before they were getting, the Israelites were getting ready to enter into the promised land, which they had toiled for for years, right? Coming out of Egypt, being rescued out of Egypt, going through all the wilderness of, of sin and other wilderness areas as they wandered for 40 years. And now they've come to the place where they're about to enter. So in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 48, then the Lord spoke to Moses that very same day saying, go up this mountain, of Abarim, of the Abarim, Mount Nebo, 
which is in the land of Moab, across from Jericho, view the land of Canaan, which I give to the children of Israel as a possession. I'm going to give it. God owns everything. He owns us. He owns his land. He can decide who lives where and who gets what. And die on the mountain which you ascend, and be gathered to your people just as Aaron your brother died on Mount Hor and was gathered to his people. Why? Because you trespassed against me among the children of Israel at the waters of Mirabah, Kadesh, in the wilderness of Zin, because you did not hallow me in the midst of the children of Israel. Do you remember what happened? They kept complaining about no water, no food, no, they got food, no meat, and they got meat, and they didn't, no water, we don't have any water, we would go back to Egypt, there's lots of water there, we could get water there. And so God told Moses how to do it. And he told Moses, speak to the rock, glorify me. And what did Moses do? Moses was provoked by these yapping, backbiting, rebellious, riotous Israelites, stiff-necked, throw that in as well. And because of that, he was so frustrated when he came to get the water, he took his rod and he struck it. And he said to them, do we, he and Aaron, do we have to give you water? God didn't like that. They didn't hallow his name. They didn't say, God's going to provide it. Watch, water come forth. That's what they were supposed to do. Instead, he said, do we have to do this? Bam, bam, and God let the water come out. But God didn't like it. Now, thankfully, as we heard in the sermonette about forgiveness, God will forgive. And God did, notice Verse 52, yet you shall see the land before you, though you shall not go there into the land which I am giving to the children of Israel. After all that toil, after all that strain, after all that stress, after all that obedience through the year, after withstanding all kinds of, of comments and backbiting, he's not allowed to go into the land. Now, we'll, we'll get the rest of the story at the end. But Moses saw the land, but was not able to go into the promised land. God has promised us a kingdom. He's promised us a kingdom, and my question for you and me, will we be able to enter it? Will we truly enter that land, or we, will we, like Moses, be shut out of the promised land, which pictures the kingdom of God? So he saw it, but he didn't enter it. How sure are you that after seeing a picture of the kingdom and seeing it year after year, I figured it out it's been 60 years now that I've been able to be at the Feast of Tabernacles, since I was 19 years, let's see, 18 years old, 1959, I went to my first Feast of Tabernacles. And this year, so I've been doing it, but you know what? What a, di what a disappointment. What, <laughs> if I don't make it, guess what? I don't get there any at all, period. My days are finished. The kingdom of God is there. Will you make it? Can you know you're going to make it? Are you sure you're going to make it? Will you be there in God's kingdom? You know, Paul was certain. The apostle Paul was certain he was going to make it. 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 to 8. 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 to 8. Can we have that same certainty in our lives? 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 to 8. Here's what Paul said. For I am ready to I am read already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. My life is withering, my life is failing, I'm going down. At the time of my departure, departure from what? From this life. 
Where would he go? To the grave, not to somewhere else. And verse 7, he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, verse 8, there's laid up for me. He didn't say, well, I hope there is. Well, I might make it. God might have a place for me. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who love his appearing. And when he comes back again, what is he going to do? Set up his kingdom. You'll be changed from physical to spirit and you will then be in the kingdom of God. He was assured. He was certain. May we be certain too? I tell you, yes. Yes, there's a way that you may be certain you're going to be in God's kingdom. And there are three steps to that, three aspects. Number first one is this. Through God's grace and power. Through God's grace and power. And let's never diminish grace for the sake of power. It's always God's power. But sometimes I get the feeling that we try to do a lot of it ourselves. And we, we eliminate the grace of God. It takes the graciousness of God in our lives to help us through. It takes his strength, not our own, to help us be there. It's not, well, I have overcome this. I didn't eat any pork today. I didn't do this. I didn't do that. Wait. Are you relying on the power of God or just your own good willpower? We need to rely on the power and might of God and the strength and the grace. Why is grace important? So when we slip and stumble along the way, God forgives us and puts us back on the right path. God gives us the strength that's through his grace. Let's look at a few scriptures. So first of all, realize it's through God's grace and his power. So Luke chapter 12, verse 32, I don't think Jesus would have said this if he didn't think God was going to really give it to you. Luke 12, verse 32. Do not fear, little flock. He talks to his church, his, his following. He said, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So is God just dangling this out there for us and saying, well, I hope you can get it. Come on, see if you can get it. I don't know if I'm going to give it to you or not. He says, it's the father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. The Apostle Paul stated this very clearly about grace. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Now saved is a word that can mean saved from sickness, can mean saved from death, could be saved from Satan, could be saved from your sins, but it also could mean saved eternally. By grace you are saved through faith. It's believing in the grace of God, that God could actually do this for you and with you. Now, God's not going to swoop you into his kingdom. God's not going to say, okay, get in your hammock now and just rock back and forth with the breeze, with the wind, and, and I'll take you. Just say, I accept Jesus. Okay, now you get to be in his kingdom. That is not the word of God, as we heard. That's not, those are not the scriptures does not have that scriptural support. On the other hand, you can't do it all yourself either. I can't do it all myself. We can't do it all ourselves. It takes God's grace and God's power. So in Ephesians 2.8, he says, by grace you have been saved through faith. It takes belief in the power of God to help you to bring us through, to forgive us. Again, sometimes people can't forgive themselves. Sometimes they can't forgive the situation. So they go on in their lives and hold this, this guilt instead of 
saying, God has forgiven me. I tell my class, told my classes when I taught, the, you know, you, you might crawl into the prayer closet when you've done something wrong and you say to God, I'm so sorry, please forgive me. And you repent and you mean it and you show that change. But when you walk out of the prayer closet, should you still be crawling? Not if you believe God. Because if you repent, he will forgive you. Now, I don't say you would walk out with your head up with pride, but I don't think you walk up, you come out of there crawling if you believe God's grace. God will forgive you and me of anything we can repent of. Isn't that amazing? I don't know how many students come into me, come into me over the years and they heard some dynamic sermon by, or lecture by Mr. Meredith or someone else, and yeah, you, know, you guys, and I don't think I'm converted. I said, well, wait, what do you mean by that? Or they might say, I think I committed the unpardonable sin. I'm so sorry. I did. I don't believe. I don't want to. I didn't want to do it, but I did. I said, are you sorry for it? Yeah, you, you didn't commit it. You commit the unpardonable sin, you won't be sorry for it. You won't care anymore. And I've had several people, you know, over the years come to, I'm, I think I committed it. Are you sorry? Yes, I'm sorry. Did you mean? No, I'm, you didn't commit it. You didn't. God forgives. Ephesians 2.8, by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Salvation is the gift of God. His Holy Spirit is the gift of God. Not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So by grace we're saved. Psalms 140 verse 7, I love this section. I've been reading through the Psalms slowly and picking up a lot of information, but in Psalms 140 verse 7, just this little snippet of information. Notice what David, Psalm of David toward the last of the Psalms, he says, O God the Lord, the strength of my salvation. The strength of my salvation. You'll find many places in the Psalms where he talks about Lord my salvation, God of my salvation, the Lord who is my salvation. God is our salvation. God is our strength, and it's trusting in him and his power. As verse 7, O Lord, the, O God, the Lord, the strength of my salvation. God is our strength, and as we go to him in prayer, and as we are close to him in study, as we are sharing with him in, in, in our prayer lives, and as we're talking and walking with him, he helps us. He strengthens us. Never forget the one comment I remember as a freshman at college Mr. Armstrong made. Do as if it all depends on you, but believe as if it all depends on God. And I can look back at a lot of things that I used to like and a lot of ways I used to be that weren't very nice. And I can say, why don't I have any interest in doing that anymore? Why didn't I for years? It wasn't because my nature was so good, because my nature led me to do those things. But it was the strength of God in our lives, in my life. So we as individuals have to rely on the strength of God for our salvation. Philippians 1 verse 6 is another beautiful verse talking about this first area of, of being able to make it through God's grace and his power. Philippians 1 and verse 6, you're probably... You probably know this one as well. It's a great verse to know. Philippians 1, 6. Being confident of this very thing, Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, which he loved very much. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you. Has God begun a good work in you? Maybe you're not baptized yet. Maybe he's beginning a good work with you. But he, once he begins, here's what it says that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, is he going to force you to have salvation? No, he'll never do that. He talked about the giant, you're in God's hands. Nobody can take you out of his hands, John 10, 29. Nobody can take you out. You know what? You can jump. God will not make you be saved. 
If we don't value God's kingdom and eternal life enough, he won't save us. We've got to want to be there. We've got to want to be in that kingdom to come. And he'll help us. He says, I'll complete it. He will not quit on us. But he can't keep you from quitting on him. And sadly enough, I have known many people, many of them are my friends on Facebook that I love. Many of them sat and listened and heard and studied and did excellently on tests and uh, on the Bible and all the rest. Sadly, they're not walking this way. Why'd they quit on God? I don't know. Maybe they weren't converted. I hope that for a lot of them. But I don't know. Romans 8, verses 9 to 11. It's got to be through his power and his might that we can do it. Romans 8, verses 9 to 11. Paul writes, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you or works with you. Now, if any man does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. He's not his. doesn't belong to him. If he doesn't have the Spirit of Christ. Notice verse 9. Sorry, verse uh, 10. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. God's righteousness in us. God helps us to live an honorable, a decent, a right, a true life by his spirit because God is righteous. God is good. Many scriptures in the Psalms talk about the goodness of God. He, if he is good, he can give it to you. I've got a sermon I'll give you one of these days entitled, Are You a Goody Two-Shoes? Are you a goody two-shoes? I think you'll be interesting. You'll be interested. It's, it's almost ready to go, but I decided not to give it yet. Look it up online. Look up goody two-shoes. You'll find some good information on it. Verse 11, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit which dwells in you. Having God's spirit in you gives you life, and it is not only life now to live it right, but its life enables us to have life eternal. Remember what Jesus Christ said as he left this earth. He told his disciples in Matthew 28, 20, and he had said in verse 18, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. And he said in verse 20, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Moses, when he was asked to lead the children of Israel, he said, God, I don't know. I'm, you told me to go up, but who's going to go with me? And God said, I will. I will go with you. God will go with us on our way to the kingdom of God. And I'll tell you one thing. God is not a loser. God is a winner. I would love to be able to win every game. I play basketball. I hope we can win this game. I hope we can win this game. I hope we can. You, know, you don't know you're going to win. God's a winner. And if you're on his side, you'll win. Let's look at the second aspect. Second aspect. First one is through God's grace and his power. The second one is be a doer. Not a talker, not just a thinker, not just a hearer, but a doer. We have got to do. We've got to practice our faith. We've got to live our faith. Matthew 24, verse 46, Jesus speaking at the end of the Olivet Prophecy. Notice what he said in Matthew 24. Went right past it into Micah. Matthew 24. 
and verse 46. Just a very short statement. Here's what he says. Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, finds so doing. God does not want us resting on our laurels, resting on our oars, just floating through the water on our, in our canoes. God wants us to be actively going. He wants us to do what we can. And it's, there's a lot for us to do. For instance, he that endures to the end shall be what? Matthew 24, 13. Saved. That means endurance. He that loves his brother knows he's passing from what? Death into life because he loves the brethren. Those are some of the doers. Let me give you a few others. Matthew 7, verse 21. Matthew 7 and verse 21. And notice what Jesus Christ gave this lesson, Matthew 7, 21 to 29. We'll read it all. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. See, it's not just talking a good fight. Oh, I love the Lord. What we knew at college, what I knew at college or came to learn after a few years, that there were people, students who came who could talk a really good talk. They could tell you how great things were, how wonderful they were doing. They would tell you how they would sometimes even be able to quote some scriptures. Did they make it? Some of them didn't make it even through college. It's not just talking. And Jesus said, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. He who does the will of my Father. It's not just, I know his will. I think about his will. I understand his will. Do you do his will? Verse 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out some demons and done many wonderful things in your name? Did they? Did they follow him? Did they believe in him? Did they practice the way that he prescribed? And verse 23, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. And who are you? I don't know who you are. Depart from me, you, you who practice lawlessness. They weren't doing what God had given them to do. Verse 24, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. He didn't just build it anywhere. He didn't just settle down. He didn't just get, get all comfortable and, and, and safe somewhere. He did it on the rock. And the rain descended. The floods, let's see. The rain descended, sorry. The floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. You can endure when you're doing God's way. And in verse 26, not everyone, now everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. <laughs> There's a nice place. Just scrape the sand off pretty easy. Just scrape it off and build my house here. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew. And we know from North Carolina, a lot of houses floated away too, didn't they? I'm not saying they were built on sand. But that principle, you know, if, you, if it's not built solidly on a rock and had a solid foundation, a rock foundation, and that rock was Christ, the Bible tells us, beat on that house and it fell, and great was, the fall, was its fall. Verse 28, so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Doing, doing God's way, practicing God's way, believing in God's way. Mark 16, verse 16, when you were baptized, you're baptized, you're on your way to eternal life. You're on your way to being saved. Baptism is an act, a rite. 
You know, you can jump in water and go underwater, and you can do scuba diving and be underwater, and you aren't forgiven your sins. But when you believe and you repent prior to being put under the water and coming up in a meaningful service, you're forgiven. Notice in Mark 16, 16, and on the way to eternal life, he who believes, Jesus Christ said this red letter, and is baptized will be saved. Baptism is an action that we must take. And once we take it, we are on the road to eternal life, which is one of our booklets, by the way. You are on the road to eternal life. So Mark 16, 16, but he who does not believe will be condemned. So faith, trust in, the, in God's grace and action by being baptized, letting somebody put you underwater, meaning I want to give up this old guy. And I was a young guy when I gave him up, and I could do a lot better job of repenting now than I did before I was baptized. But I could repent enough to say, I don't want this old guy around. Forgive him in the watery grave of baptism. And I still clearly remember 1959, December, saying, goodbye, Gare, goodbye, old guy, when I was put under. It's an act that we do. And it's, I don't mean a pretense or an entertainment. It's a right. It's an established procedure that God gives. And he says, if you've done it, you will be saved. That's a promise from God. Philippians 2 verse 12, the Apostle Paul spoke again to this church that he loves so much. One of my favorite books in the New Testament is the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. And the Apostle Paul is so upbeat, though he's in prison. He's so upbeat. Philippians 2 and verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed. That's a hallmark of God's people. They obey. They listen. They follow. They're willing to follow what God teaches and what God says. No, they don't follow garbage. No, they don't follow that which is untrue. Never follow that which is untrue. Don't be a blind follower. Be an educated follower. But in Philippians 2, verse 12, Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but much more in my absence, now, isn't it interesting? Don't we all sometimes want to be men pleasers? Somebody walked by, we try to be a little, you know, somebody who of position walked by, we want to be a little bit nicer. And it's okay to show respect. We should show respect to those who are our elders, our leaders. That is right and good. But to show preference? No. Show respect. Hold them in high respect, high esteem. But it doesn't mean you're a man pleaser that so when they come, oh, I want to make sure I'm doing the right thing now. Now when they're not out of sight, now it doesn't matter if I do the right thing. That's a man pleaser. You know, who sees you? You can't play games with God. I can't play games with God. I can't pretend to be something and say, he didn't see it. No, he didn't because he doesn't have the discernment of God's spirit that God gives when you're a spirit being. He can't see the heart. We can play games. We don't want to play games. So he says, how now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Your salvation's on the line. My salvation's on the line. If I've been baptized, my salvation is on the line. So is yours. Are we working out our salvation? And notice what he says. How do you do it? Verse 13, for it is God who works in you. That's how you do it, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So how can you be a doer? You have God in you to give you that strength, to give you that power, give you that might to help you have more willpower and do power. 
Well, my dad had great willpower. He smoked for 40 years and he didn't want to smoke anymore because he saw in a newspaper that one, a man who had some young family developed lung disease, lung cancer, and died. And my dad smoked for 40 years. Come to find out at the end of his life and my mom's latter years, he said, your mother's the one that wanted me to smoke. You did this to dad? You told dad to... Because she thought it was nicer to see a man with a cigarette in his hand that looks so charming. Mom, why'd you do that to my dad? He put it up on his dresser pack, and every morning he'd get up, he'd look at it and disdain it and go to work. He was an electrician until he overcame it. He never went back. And he was offered, and <laughs> right after dinner, he had to go work somewhere, walked into this place as a foreman uh, to oversee a job while they were putting up lighting and all that in case they needed any help with electricity. And the guy, everybody there was offering him a cigarette. <laughs> he said, I'm going to go lie down over here and rest. If you need me, I'll be in this whole room over here. Removed himself from it. Now, that's just willpower, human willpower. But God gives us his power, which is much greater than human willpower. He says, for it is God who works in you both, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Verse 14, do all things, do all things without murmuring and disputing. Where were we when we saw this sign? Don't complain. I forget there were a lot of complaining. I was standing in line somewhere. Oh, I know where it was. It was at the, was it at the DMV or something? Don't complain. <laughs> You're standing in line. Don't complain. And talked about what complaining is. God says, do all things without murmuring and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless. How can we become that? We're human. We're fallible. God's spirit in us. God gives us strength, extra help. You may become blameless and harmless. Children of God without faith in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. And I'll tell you one thing, as a light in the world, I would not be down there screaming at some senator, what you see on TV. That's not the way you show respect. Even if you disagree with them, you could say to them, call him on the phone, write him a letter and say, I disagree with you for supporting this job, if that's what your feeling was. But to stand there and yell in their face, yay, shame, 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 shame. Oh, that it irritates me so much that people have no sense. I would say, so who's paying you to do this? Do you tell me who's paying you? Why are you off job? Why, who got you here? Who paid for you to be here? Who's paying you to do? Who told you what to say? And that's what they're doing. What a shame. What a shame. Anyway, he says, you should shine in the light in the world. And verse 16, holding fast the word of life so that, you may, so that I may rejoice, Paul says, in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. So there you find what Paul wrote as a doer, applying godliness by having God in us to live that way. Philippians 3.13, just across the page. Here's what Paul wrote, Philippians 3, 13. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. I haven't made it yet. I haven't held on to eternal life. I haven't grabbed it yet. I can't grab eternal life. Where is eternal life? I can't grab it. You know, one of those claw machines, you're trying to get something out of there. You can't grab it. Even if eternal life were, it was in, were in there, you couldn't grab it. Like, you can't have it that way. I haven't apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind. When you live in the past, you could never make it better. When you live in the past, you could never make it better. And I know it's part of the grieving process to, to deny and then to bargain. Well, if I had just done this and if I had just done that. Those are all part of, the, part of the process of grieving. But you can't live there. If you get stuck there and live in the past, you can't move forward. You're stuck. Forgetting the things that are behind, he goes on to say, 
and, and moving forward, reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Forward looking. And what's ahead? The kingdom of God. And does this world need the kingdom of God? You bet. In verse 14, I press. That's doing something for, toward the goal, for the prize of the, I say, high calling, it says here, upward call, of God in Christ Jesus. I press. That's doing something. Are you pressing toward the kingdom? Are you looking toward the kingdom? Do you want the kingdom? Do you talk about the kingdom? We'll see that in a moment. One more scripture, 2 Peter 1, verses 10 and 11. This is something we can all do. Something absolutely we can all do, and with the end result, we'll be in God's kingdom. 2 Peter 1, verses 10 and 11. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent, that's doing something, to make your election and call, to make your calling and election sure. You've been called, you've been elected, you've been chosen to make your calling and election sure. Verse, last part of verse 10, for if you do these things, you'll never stumble. Now ask yourself, what are these things? They're listed, verses five through eight. What are they? Add to your faith, Have start off with faith, virtue. Add to virtue, knowledge. Add to knowledge, self-control. Add to self-control, perseverance. Add to perseverance, godliness. Add to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, agape love. If we are building the character of God step by step, we're going to make it. Why? Because you want to be like God. What is God? What's the last one? Love. What's 1 John 4, 8 tell us? God is love. You're going to be there. And he goes on to say in last part of verse 11, for so an entrance will be supplied to you. Will you barely squeak in if you do those things? Will you have somehow to slip in the back door? Notice, for so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So be a doer. Practice God's way with his strength and his power. And don't let down. Add that godly character into our lives. And as we do, we'll never fall. Third and last point. Look for the kingdom of God. Look for it now. And I don't mean here, here on earth yet, but look for it. What kind of a difference would God's kingdom make in this world? What kind of a difference would it make in some of your friends at work? What kind of a difference would it make in the workplace? What kind of difference would it make in governments? Many of which take advantage of their people heavily. I'm not saying that our, our government doesn't. But think about what the difference there will be. The beautiful time we had at the feast. How awesome is that? To have people living together and working together in harmony and so many people it took to set it up. I was very impressed with the, with the uh, detail they had. They had butterflies on a lot of the, even on the, the sound speakers, the, the sound system, the speakers uh, poles. They had butterflies. They had them wrapped in various colors. It was beautiful. Stage was beautiful. The whole area was really kept nice. I was so pleased. And the harmony and unity and everybody was good and everybody seemed fine. I don't know that we had any major problems up there. It was awesome. God's kingdom is going to be that way. If people ask you to sit over here, you sit over there. Well, big deal. I'm, I'm supposed to move this way. So what? So what? We learn. We had that opportunity. Look for God's kingdom. Matthew 6, verses 9 and 10. Matthew 6, verses 9 and 10. We're supposed to pray about it. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus Christ gave in his prayer of, of the outline prayer. He said, 
In this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do we really believe that? Do we really want that? I know when I was a younger person, I thought, well, just give me a few more years. Hopefully, I'll be able to get married and I'll be able to have a family. Just give me a few more years. You know what? The greatest time in the, you ever have will be in God's kingdom. Greatest time. You won't even be compared. You know, he talks about what God has prepared for us. It's not worthy to be pre compared to what we have here. And I don't know what God's plans are for each one of us. And I don't think you do either, except he has one big plan. He wants you in his kingdom. He wants you in his kingdom. He wants you to be a part of that glorious, wonderful time that the world is waiting for, for the, for the placing of children of God in positions of leadership. And say, well, I've never ruled a city. How many have ruled a city? Have you ruled a city? I've never ruled a city. Well, how can I be over 10 cities or five cities or one city? How can I be over any of those? When you become a spirit being, you're not going to be subject to a finite mind. God tells you, do this, 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 and this. You say, just a minute, I need to write that down. No, you, <laughs> your mind will calculate. You're a spirit being. You're not a physical being. If you're a physical being, you have to take a lot of lessons. Let me go to school, get learn how to be a governor, learn how to handle this, learn how to be a financial wizard, learn how to... When you're a spirit being, you're changed. You have the power and might and mind of God. What a great thing. Pray for God's kingdom to come. Think about it. Talk about it. Pray for it. Verse 33. Seek you first. Matthew 6, 33. The kingdom of God. Seek it and his righteousness. Seek God's kingdom. Look for it. Whoa, how, boy, God's kingdom would be do it this way. God's kingdom will do it that way. When God's here, he's going to do this. There's going to be fairness. There's going to be equity. There's going to be understanding. There's going to be proper judgment because God can see the heart, not just the words. Pray for God's kingdom to come. Want to talk about it. Talk about it with your family. Talk about it with your loved ones. Talk about it with your friends in the church. Psalms 119, verse 174, found this interesting scripture. Psalms 119, verse 174, just one brief statement. Psalms 119, verse 174. I long for your salvation. David, or the psalmist said, I long for your salvation. And your law, O oh Lord, he said, and your law is my delight. I long for God's kingdom. Do we long for it? When we see the inactions, when we see the, the inhumanity to man occurring, when we see the stupidity sometimes, when we see the riots, when we see the trouble, when we see people who can't get along, do we long for God's kingdom to come? Seek God's kingdom. Talk about it. Pray about it. Hebrews 2 verses 1 to 3. Do we talk about how great it'll be? Hebrews 2, verse 3. I'm amazed sometimes to see how the animals even have a nature to care for each other. Even animals of different kinds. How when one needs some help, well, there was an elephant helping whatever it was, a crocodile or maybe something that had fallen in, one of the other animals had fallen into the water, couldn't get out, and the elephant went over there, <laughs> helped it out. Now, why did it do that? It wasn't its kind. Where did they get some of that kindness? Who made them? God. Did God give them a little bit of that mercy, kindness, care in their natures? It's amazing. Hebrews 2, verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Do we talk about how great it's going to be? What an awesome time it will be? On the last day, we talk, talked about who we want to see, who we can't wait to see. 
in that, you know, as a spirit being when they are resurrected physically or even spiritually in the first resurrection. Who do you want to see? You want to see how tall David was? You want to see how strong he looked? You want to see what Christ looked like? What Paul? You'll be there with them. It's going to be an awesome time. Talk about it. Psalms 145, verses 10 to 13. Psalms 145, verses 10 to 13. Great section of scripture about praying. Psalm 145 and verse 10. All your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom. Do you speak of the glory of God's kingdom? Do you talk to one another? Do you talk to your family? Well, oh, that would be that. Well, when God's kingdom comes, they're going to be organized. You know, they're not going to have signs like this, these street signs that nobody can see. Well, everybody knows where that street is. Yeah, everybody who lives there, but strangers don't. You ever try to find a place in the middle of the night? We are driving darkness. You can't see the street signs. You're looking. You don't want to bang in the car in front of you. You know what I would do? And I've seen some cities in, at night. They have them lit up. So you could see them. Isn't that nice? Isn't that thoughtful? And the kingdom of God will teach order. We'll teach care. We'll teach thoughtfulness toward the stranger in the cities. Psalms uh, 40, uh, 145. Your saints shall bless you. They'll speak of your kingdom. They'll talk of your power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. They'll talk about it in verse 13. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. And you know, get behind and pray for these broadcasters for Mr. Myers for Mr. McNeely for Mr. Petty that's no easy job it's no easy job making a script sound natural it's no easy job writing regularly scripts to convey God's word and to try to motivate people that you can't even see in front of you to be a part of God's kingdom, to preach the message, the good news the, the, of God's kingdom to come. We've got a job to do. We can do it on our knees. We don't have to do it in our hands. Pray. Pray that God's message will go out. Pray that more people will hear it. Pray that God will bring in the maximum number of people that he wants before the end time. We've got a job to do. Further the gospel, talk of God's kingdom to come. Speak to our families, speak to the world. You know, the Apostle Paul in Acts 28, verses 30 to 31, you know what he was doing at the end of his life? When he, well, before he was released from prison. Do you know what he was doing in his own hired house? Preaching the kingdom of God for two years probably had chains on his feet, maybe chained to the guy next to him, and he would try to make a gesture the other guy's hand had to go up. Acts 28, verses 30 to 31. That's the scripture. I want to close, bring this third point to a close with 2 Peter 3, verse 10. 2 Peter 3, verse 10. I'll signal I'm almost finished. 2 Peter 3, verses 10 to 13. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Now some apply that to the day of the Lord when he first comes back and zaps it, or you could apply that to the before the new heavens and new earth. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. But verse 11 Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? But here's the point in verse 12. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord. And what's going to happen the day of the Lord? Jesus Christ is going to come back to set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Because of which 
the heavens will be dissolved and, he saw, and being on fire and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Verse 13, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. The new heavens and new earth can refer to the, what God has to redo this earth after the initial return of Jesus Christ and then again after that time of the, of the last before the, the, uh, new hev- the kingdom of uh, the new heavens and new earth are come to this earth when God brings new Jerusalem down. We, will we make it to Mount Nebo? Will we only make it to Mount Nebo and not enter the promised land? You see, Moses did only make it to Mount Nebo and didn't enter the promised land. However, the end of the story is Moses will be there in the promised kingdom of God. You find him listed in Hebrews 11 among the heroes of faith. And isn't it interesting, when Jesus Christ wanted to depict the kingdom of God to his disciples, he said, there'll be some of you standing here. This is the end of Matthew chapter 16, I think it's verse 28, on down to Matthew 17, 3. He said, there's some of you disciples standing here who are going to see the, me come in my glory and my kingdom. And then he took Peter, James, and John with, me, with him in chapter 17. And he was transfigured before them. While they were there, they were like in a trance. And they saw him. And they saw Moses and Elijah as a sample of who is going to be in God's kingdom. Moses was denied the promised land physically. But Moses will not be denied the kingdom of God. If we follow these three steps, that we will be able to, through God's grace and power, through being a doer, and through looking for, praying about, seeking, talking about, and longing for the kingdom of God, we'll be able to be there. As Peter said, make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, if you do these things, you'll never fail. And there'll be an abundantly opened door to welcome you and me into the kingdom of God. And that will be God's great pleasure.